I, uh, I'm a big fan of your work. I've read much of your work. I've seen many of your interviews and videos online. And uh, one of the things that I really wanted to talk to you about that I find quite interesting is consciousness mm. and your belief that consciousness is not simply calculation, but that there's something more to it and what, what you think this more could possibly be from a scientific perspective, which is unusual because a lot of people have some theories about consciousness, but they're usually crazy people like myself. <laughs> Well, I mean, we're all conscious, and so we may have theories about it. Yeah. But, um, no, the ideas came by a somewhat roundabout route. Uh, I, I went to Cambridge to do graduate work. It was mathematics. I was working on pure mathematical subjects, algebraic geometry. But I thought, you know, we've got three years. I'll spend some of the time going to other talks that might be interesting. So I went to three talks particularly, which had a big influence on me. One was a talk by Herman Bondi, was a, on general relativity, cosmology. Wonderful talk with very sort of animated presentation he had. And then there was a talk by Paul Dirac, one of the founders of quantum mechanics. And his talk, well, his complete wonderful talk too, wonderful lectures as well, but in a completely different style. He was very quiet and precise in what he said and everything. Anyway, in the very first lecture, he was talking about the superposition principle in quantum mechanics. So if you have a particle and it could be in one spot or it could be in another spot, then you have all sorts of states where it can be in both places at once. And he, that's sort of strange, but you've got to get used to that idea. And he illustrated with his piece, a piece of chalk, and I think he broke it in two to illustrate it could be in one spot or in the other. And my mind sort of wandered at that point. I don't know what I was thinking about, but I wasn't concentrating. And about a few minutes later, he'd finished his description, his explanation, and I had some vague memory of something about energy, but I didn't understand what he said, and I've been totally mystified by this ever since. So I, I suppose if I'd heard what he said, he would have said something to calm me down and, and sort of accept it in one way or another. But as it was, it seemed to me this was a, a major issue. How on earth do you have things that don't behave according to what quantum mechanics says, like cricket balls and baseballs and things like that. Anyway, that's two of the talks. The other course was a course by a man called Steen who talked on mathematical logic, and he explained things like Gödel's theorem and Turing machines, Turing machines being the mathematical notion upon which modern computers are based, or all computers, basically. And... Uh, <clears throat> uh, the thing about Gödel's theorem, you see, I'd heard, I used to have a colleague when I was an undergraduate, Ian Percival, who also became a scientist later on, and we talked about uh, logic and, you know, how you could make these kind of mathematical systems which worked out logic. And I'd heard about this Gödel's theorem, which seemed to say that there were things in mathematics that you just couldn't prove. And I didn't like that idea. But I, when I heard the, when I went to this course by Steen, and he explained what it really says. And what it says, is suppose you've got a method of proving things in mathematics. And when I say things, I mean things with numbers. The one famous example is Fermat's last theorem. Uh, there's the Goldbach conjecture, which isn't yet proved, that every even number bigger than two is the sum of two prime numbers. That's the sort of example of the thing. It's just sort of mathematical things about numbers, which you can see what they mean, uh, but it may be very difficult to see whether it's true or untrue. But the idea, is, often, is in mathematics, you've got a system of methods of proof. And the key thing about these methods of proof is that you can have a computer check whether you've done it right. So you, these rules, you know, they could be adding A and B, it's the same as B and A and things like that. And you, um, if you give, you, you say to the computer, say, here is a theorem like Goldbach conjecture, and you see whether it can be proved, and you say, maybe I've got a proof, and this follows these steps, and you give it to the computer and it says, yep, you've done it right, it's true. Or maybe it would say you've done it right and it's not true. 
or it may not say anything. It might just go on forever. But these are the sort of outcomes. And the point about it is that if you believe that these procedures do give you a proof, in other words, that if the algorithm says, yeah, it's true, then you believe that it is true because you've understood the, all the rules. You looked at the first one and said, yeah, yeah, that's okay. You looked at the second one and said, Mom, oh, yeah, oh, I see. Okay, that's great. And you go all the way down. And as long as you're convinced all those rules work, then if it says yes, that's something you believe. Okay. Now, what Gödel shows is he constructs a very specific sentence, a statement, which is a number thing, like, like the Fermat's Last Theorem or something. Think about numbers. Which, what he shows is if you trust this algorithm for proving mathematical things, then you can see by the way it's constructed that it's true. But you can also see by the way it's constructed that it cannot be proved by this procedure. Now this was amazing to me because it tells me that, okay, you cannot f formalize your understanding in, in a, a scheme which you could put on a computer. The, you see, this statement which Gödel comes up with is something you can see on the basis of the same understanding that allows you to trust the rules, that it's true, but that it's not actually derivable by the rules. It, you see it's true by virtue of your belief in the rules. And this, to me, was amazing. And I thought, golly, you know, What's understanding? What does it mean? Is it something following rules? Is it an algorithm? Well, this more or less says it's not an algorithm because whatever it was, there would be something that you could still see is true even though you don't get it through the algorithm that you had in the first place. So this was a... Oh, there are a lot of subtleties about this too which people argue about endlessly. But it was pretty convincing to me that this shows that we don't think when we understand something, that what's going on in our heads is not an algorithm. It's not following rules. It's something else. It's something that requires our conscious appreciation of what we're thinking about. And thinking is a conscious thing, and understanding is a conscious activity. So I formed the view that conscious activities, whatever they are, not just that kind of thing, but you know, playing music or or falling in love, or whatever these things might be, are not computations. There's something else going on. And then I thought, because I you know, like to think of myself as a scientist, and I think that what's going in on our heads is according to the laws of physics, and these laws of physics are um, pretty good. They seem to work well in the outside worlds, and so I believe that the laws that work in our heads are the same as those laws. So I began to think about it, well, what about Newton's mechanics? Well, you could put that on a computer. What about Einstein's special relativity? You could do that. What about Maxwell's wonderful equations, which tell you how le electricity and magnetism operate and light and radio waves and all these things? That's all follows this beautiful set of equations that Maxwell produced. You can put that on a computer. Okay, you may have to worry about approximations and the, these depend on continuous numbers rather than discrete things, but I didn't think that's the answer. Then I thought, what about general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity with curved space and all that? Well, you, we're familiar now with LIGO, this detector which has detected black holes spiraling into each other from distant galaxy. And how do we know that those signals are black holes? Well, because of calculations, people have put this thing on an algorithm, and you know what those signals look like. So Einstein's general relativity, sure, you can put that on a computer. What about quantum mechanics? Well, there's the famous equation of Schrodinger, which tells you how a quantum state evolves. You could put that on a computer too. It's difficult in many ways. There's many more parameters you've got to worry about. But it's just as computable as these other things. Well, you see, I then remembered Dirac's lecture, you see, and how it is that these things that work in the quantum world don't seem to work at the level of classical big things. And it all depends on this process of what's called measurement in quantum mechanics. And the measurement process is something you learn how to do, but it's not the Schrodinger equation. It's something else. And Schrodinger himself was 
very intrigued by this fact that his own equation gives you nonsense. And you, you, the famous Schrodinger's cat, where he produces a situation in which the cat would be dead and alive at the same time, he produced that in example simply to demonstrate that, roughly speaking, his equation gives you nonsense under these circumstances. So there's something else. And the something else goes beyond our current quantum mechanics, and it tells you what happens when the quantum state makes a decision between... Well, it doesn't follow the Schrodinger equation, does one thing or the other. Now, everybody knows that who does quantum mechanics, but they think, oh, it's what's called making a measurement, and you're allowed to do something different. But that didn't make sense to me. And so I had the view that, okay, there is a big gap in our understanding. And if there's something in the world which isn't something you could put on a computer, that's where it is. So the view, I've held that for a long time, and uh, that there's something non-computable, something beyond computation involved in our understandings of things. So that's a view I held for ages. I didn't do much with it. I just held the view until I think there was a a radio talk between Marvin Minsky and Edward Fredkin, and they were explaining about what computers can do, and they were talking about, okay, you have a computer, two computers talking to each other over there, and you walk up to the room, and the time you've walked up the room to the computers, they have commu- communi- communicated with each other more thoughts than the human race ever has done, you see. And I thought, well, I see where you're coming from, but I don't think that's what's happening. In, in human communication, human understanding is something different from what computers do. And consciousness is the key thing. Consciousness is something different from computation. So I've held that view. But then when I heard this talk by Minsky and, um, and Fredkin, I thought, well, I had ideas of writing a book sometime, you know, a long time in the future when I'm retired. This was some while back, I say. <laughs> and I thought, well, this gives it a focus. And so I wrote this book called The Emperor's New Mind, which is supposed to be saying, well, you know, we um, everybody seems to be thinking one thing, but uh, the little kid notices that, <laughs> that the emperor doesn't have any clothes. So it was the uh, that theme of that story, which was the basis of the book. So I say, okay, maybe lots of people think that all we're doing is computing, but if you stand back and you say, well... No, there's something else going on. So that was the basis of my thoughts about consciousness. But I wrote this book thinking that by the time I got to the end of the book, you see, it was, it was mostly about physics and mathematics and things like that, but I was really aiming for this thing about what's going on in conscious thinking. And I thought, well, I'll learn a bit about neurophysiology and so on, and by the time I get to the end of the book, I'll know pretty well where, what it could be. I didn't. <laughs> at the end of the book, and I just sort of tapered off rather with something a little bit unbelievable, and that was the end. Now, you see, I'd hoped that this book would stimulate young people to get interested in science and that sort of thing, that mathematics, and that was fine. And when the book was published, I didn't get letters from y- young kids. I got letters from old retired people, who the ones who'd <laughs> had the time to read my book. Okay, well, that was a little disappointing, but okay, I'm glad the old retired people like my book. But the th- other thing was, I got a letter from Stuart Hameroff, and this letter said, more or less, I think you don't appreciate that there's something else going on, not neurons. I mean, the neurons, I could see you couldn't isolate the quantum effects, and the, 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 you get the what's called environmental decoherence would happen, and you get no way of keeping the quantum state to the level that you need in this picture. So I realized I didn't have it. But Stuart Hameroff pointed out to me these little things called microtubules. And he'd built up a theory that microtubules were absolutely fundamental to consciousness. He had his own reasons for believing that. I'd never heard of them at that time. But then I checked up. You know, I get lots of letters from people who maybe don't make sense sometimes, the letters. And this one, I thought, well, is this another one? But then I realized these microtubules are there, and they look like just the kind of thing that could well be supporting the kind of level of quantum mechanics up to a level where you, you could expect the, the quantum state to sort of 
collapse. That's the terminology people use in quantum mechanics. And microtubules, they are inside brain neurons? They are indeed. And this is a recent discovery? Fairly no, recent? it's been going on for They're actually in lots of cells, you see. People often complain, oh, they're in your liver too, not mm-hmm. just your brain, so right. why isn't your liver conscious and all that? But this has to do with the organization of them and the nature of them, the particular kind of microtubules, how they're, how they're arranged, which is different in the brain. How, how does it vary in the brain compared to other cells? I think one big difference, although not Stuart emphasizes this so much, there are two kinds of microtubules. They're the ones called the A lattice and the B lattice. And the A lattice ones are the very symmetrical ones. They're tubes and, and they look the same all the way around. They've got a very beautiful arrangement of these proteins called tubulin and they make a very nice arrangement which is connected with Fibonacci numbers and things like that. So they look a bit like fur cones, but they're all parallel. They're not, they don't um, taper off. But um, uh, the thing is, in the brain, I think most microtubules are probably what are called B lattice ones, and they don't have so much symmetry. They've got a, a, a sort of seam down the one side, and they're very important in transporting sub- substances around cells and so on. And microtubules, all sorts of things. They don't just do what what Stuart and I think they may be doing in the brain. So the idea is that in the brain, they're organized differently. And the, probably the ones that are important are the A lattice ones, which are the very symmetrical ones. And for a long time, people couldn't see the difference and, um, because they look very similar. Um, and they may well be the ones that happen to be in pyramidal cells as a particular kind of cell. So, uh, you know, one of the things that in- interested me a lot is how it is that not all parts of the brain are the same in this respect. You see, you've got the cerebrum. This is the part at the top and, you know, divided down the middle. And that, when you see brains, that's what you normally see with the convolutions in, in, in it. But right underneath and at the back, there's a thing called the cerebellum, which more, looks more like a, like a ball of wool or something. And the cerebellum, I don't, I, it may still be argument about this, but it seems to be that it's completely unconscious. And it has comparable number of neurons, far more connections between neurons than the cerebrum. And it's what takes control when maybe when you're driving your car and you're thinking about something else and you, you don't, you're not thinking what you're doing because it's unconscious. And the unconscious control, you know, a pianist who's very expert and moves the fingers around and plays a note with a little finger, that pianist doesn't think, well, I've got to move that muscle this way and this bone that way and so on. And it's, it's all controlled unconsciously. And a lot of this unconscious control is done somewhere else in the cerebellum when you, when you get really skilled. So uh, it seemed to me, okay, you've got different kinds of structures, different, and it could well be that these pyramidal cells which have a particular organization of microtubules are the ones that where the consciousness is really coming, coming to light mainly. I don't know, there's a lot which is, which is not, known about this, controversial and all sorts of things. But the cerebellum seems to be different and organized differently. So it's not just how many neurons, how many connections are there, because there are more in the cerebellum. So it's not that, it's something and else. Do they know this from observing the brain through fMRI or something like that during particular uh, activities? Like uh, I don't know. I would imagine partly just examining it when, from dead people and looking at brains and trying to estimate how many neurons there are in it. Right, but how would they know what which Part, oh, which are is conscious. During particular well, activities. I, I don't know that they do know all that well. I guess, mm. but the the cerebellum, there is a bit of an argument about that. I think whether it's completely unconscious or not, but it seems that actions that that are carried out by the cerebellum, you you don't you're not aware of what you're doing. Mm. But I mean, it's you know, if you're the tennis player who has to think very carefully about whether you know what way to tilt the ball. Now the control of what you're doing so overall control is probably done with the cerebrum but the cerebellum is controlling the detailed motions how the fingers move and all that kind of thing and then you make sure that if you the player thinks you're going to hit the ball down down the line there and then the the rest is done under the uh, control of an unconscious procedure i mean i I may be simplifying but i I understand what you're saying so you're saying that there's we don't totally understand, but we know that there's different parts of the brain that are responsible for different activities, and yes. some activities don't seem to be conscious. Yes, yes. I mean, I think it's probably the case 
No, I'm, I maybe I don't know. I, I shouldn't make a statement. I don't really know. But certainly, there are lots of different parts of the cerebrum which maybe which maybe not conscious too. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying that the whole thing is capable of being conscious. It's, there seem to be differences in different parts. But are you convinced that microtubules are responsible for consciousness, or it's a, a primary <laughs> theory? I think they're the one of the best candidates. I, you see, I don't think it's only microtubules. Mm. I don't know. I, I'm not sure what Stuart Hamroff's view on this is. He certainly thinks the microtubules are exceedingly important in consciousness, and I think he's right. That's the feeling I get. And he's done a lot of work on trying to find uh, what anesthetic gas is. It's an important... One of the important ways you can tell things about consciousness, most of it you can't, it's just hearsay and whatever mm -hmm. it is. But one of the important ways you can tell something about consciousness is what turns it off in a reversible way. And Stuart's job is uh, to, you know, he's an anesthesiologist. He puts people to sleep. Well, I think he would complain if I say putting it to sleep because under anesthetic is actually different from right. sleep. But you make them unconscious in a reversible way. You want to make sure that you can wake them up again. And uh, it's obviously a very skilled thing. But I guess a lot of his colleagues might be skilled at doing it, but don't they ask the questions about what they're actually doing from the point of view of the biology and the physics and so on. So Stuart was really interested in that question. Partly, I think, things like uh, mitosis, cell division. Mm. And he was very struck by the way that the chromosomes all line, line up and that there's these, these microtubules which are pulling them. And they're a really big part in, 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 in the structure of cells and how they, how they behave and so on. But why their consciousness? Well, I guess it was his experience with, with um, putting people under anesthetics and the fact that the gases which put you to sleep and they're Again, I shouldn't say to sleep, but <laughs> right. put you under anesthetic are, are very unconnected chemically. They're different kinds of things, but yet they still seem to have the same effect. And to understand what it is that they affect is, you know, that's his, a lot of his interest is to do with that. So just by putting someone unconscious and registering what parts of the brain are n no longer active... This is what they're using to sort of reverse engineer by turning those parts on. That's what enables consciousness. Is this the... Well, I think it's probably a simplification of, of what's yes. going on. But that's, that's a good uh, first, <laughs> first step. Yes. 